Hi there! This is Sarah Kuhn, and welcome to the first episode of The Quiet Ones. I'm so glad that you guys are here. I hope that you're having a wonderful day. I'm so excited to start this podcast with you. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the reason that I want to do this podcast. And the reason is to reach INFJs. I know as an INFJ, I feel alone a lot. And sure, I have friends and family, and I actually have more friends this year than, than really what I've ever had in my life. But none of them have the same personality that I do. And while I connect to them and I enjoy their company, there isn't always a lot of understanding because they think about things differently than I do um, and they process things differently and their emotions are different than mine. There isn't a lot of understanding and some of them do try to understand what I'm going through and how I think and, and feel, but because their brain works differently than mine, they don't have the same level of understanding um, as other INFJs do. So I really wanted to create a place, not just for me to connect with other people, but to connect other INFJs together. That's why I started uh, my Instagram account, which is INFJ Woman. Um, I had so many graphics about INFJs because once I realized that I was one, I started collecting all of these things. And I thought to myself, I wonder if somebody else might need these as much as I do. I wonder if somebody else might benefit from this as much as I have. So I thought, well, okay, I'll create an Instagram account and maybe, you know, maybe 10 or 15, maybe if I'm lucky, 100 people will follow me. But if I can just help one of those people, that's really all that I wanted to do. And now... There's over 27,000 people that follow the account, and it's just, it's amazing to me. And I get messages all the time from people telling me how much it helps them and how they feel like they have a place where they belong. That's exactly what I want. I want to create that community. And with this podcast, I just feel like it could be a lot bigger. So the format of the podcast is me reading stories from other INFJs um, and also interviewing people who are either INFJs or who are related to other INFJs. And like I said, it's all about creating an experience, a place where INFJs can come and feel that sense of belonging, that sense of, of some of understanding so that you can relate to really what's going on and and what's being said, and so that you can learn more about yourself as well. So in this episode, I want to talk about two different things. The first thing we're going to talk about, what is an INFJ? And then the second thing we're going to talk about is the INFJ door slam. And I have several different stories from people about door slams that um, I'm going to share with you. First off, we're going to talk about what is an INFJ. So the term INFJ comes from the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator Personality Test. So the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator says that every single person in the whole world falls into one of 16 different personality types. Okay, so the first letter means that you're either introverted or extroverted. The second letter is intuitive or sensing. The third letter is thinking or feeling. And the fourth letter is judging or perceiving. So what do those letters mean? If you're an INFJ, that means you're introverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging. So introverted means that you are energized by alone time. Intuitive means that you see patterns and possibilities. Feeling means that you prioritize people and emotions. And judging means that you prefer structure and order. So how do you know what personality type you have? There are several different ways that you can figure out. The first thing that I would suggest that you do is go to a website called 16 Personalities. They have a free test that you can take, and it only takes about 10 minutes, so it's really pretty easy. The most important thing, though, is that you are really honest with yourself when you answer the questions. It's really easy to fall into the trap of answering the questions based on how you want to be or based on how you think others perceive you. 
but it's extremely important that when you're taking the test, you're honest with yourself about how you actually are. So then after you take the test, make sure that you read through the descriptions. So once you get the results, it will have percentages because not everybody is 100% introverted or 100% extroverted. Most people fall into the spectrum somewhere. So um, I think mine is like 93% introverted, but then 7% extroverted. So if any of your numbers come up 50-50 or close to 50-50, then it's important that you read through the descriptions of both of those, both of the different types that you could fall under um, to make sure that you're typed correctly. When I figured out my personality, it was kind of a process. I know that a lot of people ask me, how do you know for sure, for sure, what personality type that you have? I first took the test when I was in college. It was a requirement for one of the classes that I took. And um, the test came back I-N-X-J, and the X means that it's 50-50 for whatever letter that is. So it was 50-50 for either I-N-T-J or I-N-F-J. Like I said, I was in college, so I was super busy. So I just kind of threw it in a box and continued about my life. Um, It was a couple of years later that I found it again, and it was at a time where I was really searching um, and struggling with some places in my life. And I went through it again and started reading about, about my personality and why I do the things that I do. And I really found it incredibly helpful. And I ended up taking the test again, and it came back INTJ. And I was reading the description of it, and I thought, yeah, that's exactly me. Um, that's exactly how I am. And really, it turns out that's exactly how I thought that I wanted to be. (laughs) So it wasn't until a few years later, actually, that um, I had told my 13-year-old niece about the test, and she took the test, and she typed as an INTP. So she's very straightforward in the way that she communicates, and she will call you out on things. And so we were talking about, um, I think she was having a problem with her grandma or something. And so I was trying to explain to her how she had hurt her grandma's feelings and how, you know, you need to do this in the future and you need to make sure that you're doing this so that you don't, you know, get into this mess again. And, and she's like, you're always thinking about feelings. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's important to consider people's feelings. And she's like, I think that your personality type is wrong. She's like, I don't think that you're an INTJ. I think that you're an INFJ. And I was like, no, don't say that. Take it back. Take it back. Like, I was so scared of having a feeling personality type because I thought that that meant that I would had to be like this overly emotional type of person. I thought, you know, that meant that I would be crying all the time and super upset about things and just, you know, feelings all over the place. And I was just horrified when she said that. But it really got me thinking, though. Um, So I, I started researching more about what INFJ meant. And... I came to the realization that you can have a feeling personality type, but not have an overabundance of outward feelings. I have incredible feelings. They're so deep and so huge, but I don't show them to people. The majority of them are on the inside. It's very, very rare that I ever cry in front of people. It's very rare that that I get extremely emotional or even angry in front of people. That's something that, for me, it's incredibly personal, and I don't want to share it with other people. I would much rather have this stoic personality, um, especially at work and in front of other people like that, where it's like, I don't want you to know that what you're saying is affecting me, but it really is affecting me like (laughs) an awful lot. But I'm not going to tell you that it does. I'm just going to worry about that later. Um, So I think that that's where I kind of I wanted to be INTJ because I feel like that's how they are. They just don't let things affect them. And so I thought that sounds really cool. I'd really like to be like that. Um, 
But when I was really honest with myself, it was like, no, I'm like that on the outside, but that's not really not what's going on on the inside. For some people, figuring out what personality type that you have is definitely a process. It's, it's not always just, okay, I took the test. Here's what the results came back. That's exactly what it is. Sometimes, you know, we, we have to really be honest with ourselves and then read about the descriptions and then see, okay, what fits here and what doesn't fit. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is what we call the INFJ door slam. So first of all, I wanted to tell you exactly what the door slam is because I know that there's been some confusion about it. It's kind of a term that's been going around there. But based on some comments that I've gotten um, around social media um, and some people that I've spoken to, I don't think that a lot of people really know what it is. The door slam is when an INFJ cuts somebody out of their life completely. A lot of times it's without any discussion or warning, and it includes blocking phone numbers, unfollowing and blocking this person on social media and email, and sometimes it even includes moving to a different place and changing your phone number. Sometimes it's really extreme. Now, I say that it's without any warning or discussion, But that doesn't mean that there isn't a reason for it. INFJs are known as being very friendly and personable and understanding. We are definitely people pleasers who put the people in our lives ahead of us for the most part, ahead of ourselves. So we'll go out of our way to make sure that all the people around us are well taken care of. But there is a line. There's a point where enough is enough. There's a point where we've been betrayed or taken advantage of so much. And this is where we'll respond in this way that's called a door slam. So like I said, there's always a reason for it. It doesn't ever come out of nowhere. But when it does happen, there usually isn't a lot of discussion around it. There may be one last opportunity um, given, one last confrontation. But after that, it's this is the end. And more times than not, there is no going back. So who gets the door slam? It can be applied to anybody, friends, family, significant others. It can happen at work. We don't really discriminate. It's really anybody that we've gone out of our way to do things for, to be there for, and they've betrayed us, they've neglected us, they've been some kind of a toxic presence in our lives, and... It, it gets to the point where it's like, okay, I've given you way too many chances and you just have to go. Like, I can't let you hurt me anymore. Now, I know that you may be th- thinking, okay, that sounds really, really extreme. You just cut somebody out of your life like that. And sometimes it's without any warning for them, or I shouldn't say any warning. I should say sometimes it's without one last warning. But the thing that you have to remember is that INFJs are very sensitive people. And like we spoke about before, we may not be sensitive on the outside, but we definitely are on the inside. We put so much into our relationships and we're so deeply affected by the way that people treat us, especially the people that we value the most in our lives. So there's only so much hurt that we can take before we just collapse underneath the weight of it all. So for us, a door slam is a solution for self-preservation. It's not the first line of defense, though. Like I said, from the outside, it might seem that way. But we give people chance after chance after chance. And sometimes this is what it comes to. Because we don't like conflict, Because we don't like any kind of disharmony in our lives, sometimes we just don't have another choice. And it's the only option that's left. And it's not something that we take lightly either. There's an awful lot of thought and consideration that goes into it when we take a measure like this. A healthy INFJ will realize that there's nothing else that they can do but to cut that toxic person out of their life for good. Okay, so I want to read some stories from real INFJs, and these are stories about a door slam. 
So the first one comes from Brigetta, who is in Jakarta, Indonesia. She says, my last door slam happened when my mother gave me strong advice for me to go to work to replace one of her friend's sons in his office. I was planning to resign from my job. It was about a year ago. She was more than persuading me. She told me about 10 times, and I kept rejecting her because I just hate being in her cycle of networks, as I know the environment and the habit. I wanted to be independent from her. Having too many suggestions and helps from her just makes me feel less and less confident about myself, and it was suffocating. The next day, she stopped asking me to try, and I did find a new job by myself later. As a child, I had selective mutism at school until I was about nine. I don't know exactly why, but I wasn't feeling prepared to join the school community, and I didn't talk almost since my first day at school. I hate being in a crowded group, but I really felt peace when playing with my older brother at home, just the two of us and I talked a lot to him. When playing a video game with him, I almost feel like a recharge. I love playing Legos by myself for hours, drawing for hours, or playing dolls with my younger sister. These activities are relaxing for me. Now I'm in my 30s and working as a graphic designer. I dreamed of a less crowded workplace, but I know this is not very common. Actually, I don't hope to work with less people, but I crave more intense, meaningful, and close relationships with my coworkers. People who understand my vision and respect it, with less small talk and more serious conversation. That kind of relationship will fulfill my life. I know it is hard to have. I feel honored if I can help people, at least help them with their difficulties through my mission. Bridgetta, thank you so much for your story. I absolutely agree with you. I would love a workplace that has less people. It seems like there are so many people in every single office, and the whole concept of an open office space these days is just the worst concept in the world, honestly, if you ask me. I am actually, I work in graphic design and marketing during the day. I have a full-time job and I work in a cubicle in an office that only has about 25 people, which doesn't seem like a lot, except when they're all in there and they're talking and there's three or four people that instead of getting up from their desk, they just yell across the office. <laughs> it seems like there's an awful lot of people at those times. So I completely understand what you mean. and also. When you said that you want less small talk and more serious conversation, I love that as well. I, I really wish that I could have that too. So again, thank you so much for sending your story. Okay, the next one is from Jessie, and she's from Cornwall Bridge, which I believe is in England. And she says, My biggest door slam was when I left my fiancé with our daughter and moved to the other side of the country at the drop of the hat. I don't regret leaving my fiancé because I had a good reason to. But I do miss him a lot, and after two years of no talking, we are now getting back together. The impact of leaving my fiancé for those two years was huge because we have a three-year-old and she is getting to know him again. Our relationship feels like it is going to be stronger than ever now, though because we both have done a lot of growing up. You don't truly know if you love someone still or not until you end up doing a door slam on them and see if you end up missing them or not. Another door slam for me was when I stopped talking to and having any contact at all with my dad because it felt right for me vibrationally after dealing with all of his negativity growing up. I don't regret door slamming my dad for even a second, and it will be a year this November. The impact that not talking to my dad has left is I feel more free, happier, and I don't think about it unless someone happens to bring him up, and just overall feel great. Thank you, Jesse, so much for sending your stories. So there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about here. The first is toxic relationships. Jesse didn't specify exactly why she left her fiancé, but I'm sure she had a really good reason in order to move across the country at the drop of a hat. That's not an easy thing to do. And the second thing was door slamming her dad. It's so much more difficult when it comes to your family. 
I know that a lot of people say that blood is thicker than water. I don't really agree with that, honestly. Um, I think sometimes the people who can hurt you the most are the people who are closest to you. And it's definitely, definitely a lot harder to deal with a door slam situation when it's your family. Okay, so the next story comes from Andre. I think that's how you say the name, Andre. Um, and that, and she is in Valencia, Spain. And she says, um, The door slam happened during my high school years with my best friend at the time. I shared with him my biggest secret at the time, believing I could trust him. Little did I know what was about to happen. After talking with him, a few days later, another friend asked me about what I told him, which was not possible because nobody else knew. After confronting my best friend and he denying everything, which I knew it was a lie, and not even apologizing, it happened. The door slam. After that day, he just didn't exist anymore. I didn't care about anything regarding him, neither good or bad. I didn't even say hi to him if we met on the street, even though he did say hi to me. After some time, the anger dissipated, but the indifference didn't. That's when I started learning about myself and began to realize that I was an INFJ. Thank you so much for your story, Andre. I definitely agree with what you say. A lot of times, there isn't anger. It's more, in, it's more indifference, honestly. I think by the time that we decide to door slam somebody, we're already past the anger, and it's more of survival, and it's just more indifference. We learn to accept what life is like without them. So the last story that I wanted to share with you is one of my own, actually. Um, I've used the door slam a few times in my life. Um, I've used it on every boyfriend that I've ever had, it seems like. I can't do the whole let's be friends thing. It just doesn't work for me. If we're not going to go out anymore, let's just pretend like we never existed to each other. That's just how I operate. I think the biggest door slam for me was my older sister. I know it's really hard to talk about, especially when it's your family. Especially just thinking about doing something like that to a family member is incredibly difficult. But sometimes it's necessary. And I wanted to share this with you guys because I want you to know that when you have people in your life who are toxic, who are hurting you in some way, and not just once or twice, but repeatedly over a number of years, that sometimes the only thing that you can do is remove those people from your life. And it doesn't matter whether they're family members or friends or whoever they are. Sometimes you're better off removing them from your lives. I kind of got ahead of myself there, so let me tell you the story. So my older sister has a substance abuse problem, and she's had this problem now for more than 10 years. And it's really sad for me, especially because we were like twins growing up. We're only a couple of years apart, and we did everything together. She was my person. Anytime I needed anything, she was the person that I went to. We have opposite personalities. So she's very outgoing and friendly, and she loves people, and she has all these great ideas. And I was the more laid-back person who was like the sidekick. I was the one who dealt with all the details and was the responsible one in every situation that we got into. There were tons of situations. But it was fun, too. Uh, because she was the leader and I was the person who was always following behind, doing everything that she said that I should do, right? But then, unfortunately, about 10 to 12 years ago, um, she started down this road of making bad decisions. And I didn't really even understand how bad it was because in this situation, she didn't get into a bad problem overnight. It was a gradual progression. And I really didn't have any way of knowing how bad that it would get either. I spent years and years trying to help her, trying to make her see that she had a problem and that she needs help. Even now, she still doesn't think that she has a problem and she refuses to get help. So for anybody who's dealt with somebody in this situation or who's, who's been in this situation themselves, 
the first step to getting help is admitting that you have a problem. And if you can't admit that, then you can't get help. For her, she won't admit that she has a problem. Instead, she just has all of these issues. And I put up with her lashing out at me numerous times, blaming me for all of her problems, and her demanding that I do something to help her, not in a, hey, I want to go to rehab kind of way, but in a, hey, I need money, you need to give me money type of way. So I put up with all of that for years and years. But after all these years of me trying and failing, I realized that something really important was missing. If she can't admit that she has a problem, then it doesn't matter what I do to help her. She's not going to get better. There's nothing that I can do to help her until she admits that she has a problem. So a few years ago, I decided that enough was enough. I no longer wanted to deal with her emotional abuse or with the toxic behavior. I just couldn't. I couldn't be responsible for her problems anymore. It was affecting me way too much. So I blocked her phone number on my phone. I deleted her from all of my social media without any warning or explanation. And I really haven't looked back since. The impact that it has had on me has been mostly positive, though there have been some negative things. There are still times when I miss her. I miss her like crazy. Like I said, she was my person. I miss having her as my best friend in my life. But I've gained so much by not having to deal with her being so toxic. She was this larger-than-life personality when we were growing up, and I was always in her shadow. But now I feel like I've really stepped out of her shadow, of her opinions, of her negative comments. I've learned how to be myself. I've learned a lot about me, a lot about what I want. And I've learned how to stand up to other people rather than just accept what they say. At times I do feel guilty. At times I still think, Maybe there's something I can do to help her. Maybe I did the wrong thing. But then I hear from other people who are still still dealing with her that she's still doing the same thing, that she doesn't want to admit that she has a problem. And again, I realize there isn't anything that I can do to help. There's absolutely nothing I can do. The only thing that I can do is to set a boundary to protect myself from a toxic situation. So that was my experience with a door slam. Like I said, that's not the only one that I've ever done. Um, There have been a few, unfortunately, but there's really always a good reason behind them. They don't just come out of nowhere. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next segment, and this is called Ask Sarah. I get a lot of questions from people about INFJ-related things, and I wanted to share some of them with you because I know that a lot of people ask me the same questions. I thought it would be nice for everybody to hear some of these answers. Okay, so this one is from Elizabeth. Hey, Sarah, I've been a fan of your page for a while now. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's nice to know there is another INFJ woman out there with the same mindset. I was hoping for some advice on more of a job or career path for myself. Basically, the current day job I have is in retail, but the products we sell have to involve us with the customer quite a lot. It's not as simple as selling bread. Our products are for projects. I have to deal with emotional customers whose project has failed, deal with phone calls and emails daily. Now, I love the products we sell. I love the projects and helping people achieve results, but the whole job in itself is mentally draining for me, as you would know. I have been in it for three years now and never have any energy. Even my boss complains about this, and it's hard to explain it to her. It's not me being lazy. I feel like it's a stab at who I am because I can't keep up and be so happy and smiley 24-7. Everything I have read about INFJs says sales and customer service is a no-no. What would be a solution rather than moving over to another retail job that has the same issues? Many thanks, Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth, I completely understand what you're saying, especially about being in a retail job. I actually worked in retail for um, probably 10 years through high school and college and then a little bit after college. Retail is very draining because you deal with customers all day long. And I know that that's why a lot of a lot of websites that offer advice for INFJs about careers, they say don't go into sales and customer service. And I understand why they say that. Like I said, you're dealing with a lot of people and INFJs don't really like to deal with a lot of people, especially with that many people all day long. It's really hard like what you said, to keep up your energy and to be happy and peppy all the time. And I think that's a big reason why people say INFJs shouldn't go into sales and customer service. But it doesn't mean that you can't have a job in sales and customer service. I actually work in marketing now full time and I love working in marketing. Most of what I do, thankfully for me, is behind the scenes type of things. And a lot of things in marketing now are digital marketing. So it's less customer facing and more sitting behind a computer desk, which is really good for me. Just because you're an INFJ doesn't mean that you can't do anything that you want to do. Because I firmly believe that any INFJ can do anything that they want to do. When you work in a job that's more customer facing, what you need to do is to spend more time recharging. So all INFJs need to spend time recharging because we're introverts. We need alone time. We need time doing things that are relaxing for us that help us recharge our batteries. And because you're in a job where you're dealing with customers all day long and you have such intense social interaction, not only with customers all day long, but you said that they're emotional too. Um, So that can be incredibly draining as well. Not only the people, but the extra emotions on top of that. There are several things that you need to do. The first one would be to set boundaries around those people to make sure that you're not soaking up all of their emotions because I know that it's incredibly easy when you're dealing with emotional people to just soak all of that in and take it on as your own emotion. So you need to make sure that, that you're doing as little of that as possible. And then the second thing that I would say is to spend more time doing self-care. Spend more alone time, more time relaxing, Um, more time doing anything that makes you feel happy or feel good. So whether that's taking a long walk in nature, whether it's working out or reading a book or whatever the case may be, self-care is incredibly important to help you regain your energy. And you said that you've been there for three years as well. So maybe it's time for you to take a vacation. Um, If you have some vacation time to take a week or two away from your job so that you can really have some intensive self-care and you can really decide, is this something that you want to continue to do or maybe there's something else that you would rather do that maybe isn't so customer facing. But whatever you decide to do, I hope you listen to your intuition. I'm sure that you already know what you need. I just want to be the one to give you the permission to do that, whatever it is. All right, ladies, I think that that's all that I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate all of your support. I love reading all of your comments, and I try very hard to read all of my direct messages. So if you have something that you would like to talk about, please let me know. Um, You can send me a direct message on Instagram at INFJ woman or on Facebook as well. Same thing, facebook.com slash INFJ woman. I would love to hear your stories, whatever stories that you have to share. I would really love to hear them. You can go to my website to find a list of the upcoming podcasts um, for the different story topics that I'm looking for. That's infjwoman.com slash podcast. But really any story that you have, I would be more than happy to share. And you can send those to me again on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email them to me at podcast at infjwoman.com. And there's also a place on my website where you can submit them. And again, that's infjwoman.com slash podcast.